Welcome to Building Bellingham. I'm your host, Leo Cohen. Season two is starting off a little different than season one. We're not in the studio and our conversations are live streamed onto the Building Bellingham Facebook page before they make their way here. We're a little rougher around the edges, but the core is the same. Honest conversations with local entrepreneurs, talking about challenges, failures, and the effort it takes to build a successful business. Join me as we dive into the story behind one of Bellingham's biggest brands. You are in your natural environment. I'm in my natural habitat. I thought I would share that with all of you. I'm in the R&D kitchen where I also have an office and then I also have my R&D kitchen here and it's really where I spend most of my time um, when I'm not on my feet all over the bakery every day. So for those of you who don't know Erin, this is Erin Baker and uh, she has Erin Baker's Wholesome Baked Goods. And so if you've been on an airplane, specifically Delta or American Airlines, if you've been to Costco, which I think 99% of humans have been to Costco, grocery stores, coffee shops, you're going to see Aaron Baker's uh, breakfast cookies. And that's just one of your products, but that is probably your staple. And, and there's a history to it that we're going to go through today, which I'm super excited for. So thank you for joining us on the Building Bellingham podcast, the feature length. Entirely my pleasure. So we, we are on season two. This is episode two. Um, Aaron, who are you? Where are you, where are you from? Tell us a little bit about you. Um, <laughs> born and raised in Washington state, born uh, in Spokane, um, and then raised in the San Juan Islands, uh, mostly on Orcas Island. I moved to uh, the San Francisco Bay Area uh, when I was about 12 years old and spent about 10 years there um, before I moved back to Washington. Um, in the San Francisco Bay Area, I received a lot of, I gained a lot of experience in the food and beverage world, and it really introduced me to um, fine cuisine, fine wine. Um, I was working for this great restaurant group. Um, you know, my mom's favorite restaurant was Chez Panisse. You know, that's Alice Waters. Alice Waters started the, you know, the new cuisine, California cuisine movement. So I was really, um, you know, marinated in the idea that food should be simple, it should be fresh, and um, we should nourish our bodies with what we put in our mouths. And, um, you know, I came back to Washington after California just, it was very expensive and, um, you know, I really wanted to come back to my roots and I moved back to Whidbey Island and that is where I started Aaron Baker's Wholesome Baked Goods. Yeah, and you mentioned something about um, wanting to have fresh, wholesome nutrients in your food. Is there a problem in America right now with how food is consumed and how it's processed? I mean, did, I mean, does, did that kind of negative side of our food industry propel you into wanting to distribute better nutrients to people? Absolutely. Um, my mom raised us on whole food. She baked our bread. She grew our vegetables and canned and dried um, along with working a job as well. Um, she really taught the, the kitchen was definitely a classroom for me. Uh, I spent a lot of time in the kitchen with my mom and she would tell me what she was doing and why she was doing it. Um, you know, she said, there's always a place for a little bit of sugar, a little bit of butter. There's always a place for a Coca-Cola, you know, um, but not, not, not as a regular thing. And so I was really infused with the ideals that we have today. And that is, there's, there's a time and a place for dessert. There's a time and a place for, you know, for, for a soda, you know, and a taco. Um, but for the most part, I eat for sustenance. Um, and then I, you know, like I say, I party on the weekends or, you know, if I go to a party, I eat, you know, some really, some food that's not that great for me, but it's really enjoyable. So that's really the premise that I started my business. Um, and I wanted to bring healthier packaged food to America. And in 1994, there were 45 million Americans that were not eating breakfast on a regular basis. I had identified. That's yeah. 45 million Americans, now it's, I don't even know the statistic now, it's probably like 60, 65. Last time I looked, it was like 58. So um, breakfast is a tough one for people. Um, I think, you know, it, it, everyone's in a hurry, number one. Um, number two, you know, I don't know, I'm not a big breakfast eater and that's really why the breakfast cookie resonated with me so much. Uh, when I was little, my mom used to make an oatmeal cake and she would put all the brown fruit in it and that's really what inspired the breakfast cookie was, you know, this dense oat nutrition 
um, you know, sweetened with fruit and she'd send us out the door and be gone for hours with this, you know, with this really energy packed, you know, snack to go. So that's really what inspired the breakfast cookie. And, you know, 27 years ago, it was, it was kind of a hard sell until I could, I'm like, just try it, just try it. It tastes good. And, you know, the breakfast cookie has propelled forward on its own steam. Um, once people try it, they love it. And we've had customers for 27 years. So what is that moment like? So there's, there's kind of a, a tipping point, right? There's a point where you're, and this is where the blue bite comes into play, right? There's yeah. a tipping point um, where you're doing, it's, let's say you're doing one action and you're getting 10% of the result. You're out there, you're grinding, people eat the cookie. They're like, what, how, where do I find this? And you're, then you're like, well, I don't have my website up or this, that, or the other. There's this, this like pre-tipping point as a, as a business owner. Tell me a little bit more about how much energy goes into that pre-tipping point and what is that tipping point like? And have there been multiple tipping points for you as you've right. propelled your business? Yeah. Well, the energy that goes, you know, from when, when you have the dream, right? I had the dream. Uh, this is what I'm going to do to actually making enough money to support myself. That, that was it was a while. It was five, you know, five years. And um, I worked two other jobs while I was baking at night. And, you know, my days for five years, I was working well, six, 14, 16 hours a day. And, and you know, it, you just do what it takes. Um, th there isn't anybody to complain to, you know, there isn't anybody to be like, hey, I need a day off. Woo. Um, it's all you. It's all your own steam. And uh, it, it, you I did whatever it took and, and, and it, it took a lot, but it was my dream and, and it was mine and that really propelled me forward. Um, the, the tipping point for me, the first tipping point for me was getting the cookies into um, a couple of grocery stores in Seattle. One of them was QFC. Um, most people in the state are familiar. Yeah, QFC was my first real grocery store account, Kroger. Uh, Kroger holding. And, you know, things really started to take off from there. Um, you know, once they kind of got into the into the city, and you know, there was more word of mouth, and things really um, grew very fast from there. Um, you know, people were like, this cookie's amazing. It's filling me up. It's healthy. It's delicious. Where can I get more? And um, at the time, I, I don't, I mean, this was, gosh, 90, 98, maybe. 97 and I didn't even have a website I I don't think I don't think I, had, I don't even think I had a website so I was just taking phone orders and um, it, it was great it, it really just kind of exploded and that's when things really took off was you know like 98 99 2000 um, so that was the first tipping point so what I mean comparing to starting a business now versus starting a business when you did that's a whole separate job. So you're already working 14 to 16 hours. And then you're also answering phones. Once this was just starting to, to really get some momentum. Yeah. What do you think? I mean, what, do you think there would be a different world if you had started your business five years ago when internet, you know, you have these uh, uh, landing pages with, you know, Shopify and uh, Squarespace and all these things. Do you think it would have been a different world for you to start this business then? Or do you think it would have been the same thing no matter what the vision was the same the whole time. I think the vision would have remained the same. I just probably would have had more opportunities to scale faster because people that are starting their businesses now and, you know, really in the last 15, you know, 20 years have, you know, the entire country or the whole world to sell to. Um, so there's, I think there's more opportunity now to scale fast uh, for me, it was, you know, just really kind of bootstrapping grassroots. And, you know, my, my, my mom was not, is an entrepreneur. And so I was, I was pretty familiar with that process and, you know, what it took. So it didn't seem too out of the ordinary for me. Yeah. So for you and for me and for other entrepreneurs out there that are at some point in their journey, right? Cause it's all a journey. There's no, there's not really an end result. There's little checkpoints, right? Um, right. How do you, when you're building a business and it's unique, because what you did was very unique. There was, I, I have never seen any other, and I'm not just saying this, I've never seen any other breakfast cookies that are as well presented and as delicious as yours are. And 
the coolest part is that you just had this belief or vision that you were going to make something better than what was out there. Even if people are saying, Aaron, cookies shouldn't be healthy. They're like, we need just more snickle in the world. And you're like, no, but there can be a healthy cookie. How do you, how do you put those horse blinders on? Tell me more about that process for you. How do you have that steel trap of this vision is going to happen one way or another, whether you have Shopify or not, or whether you have, you know what I mean? Like you're, it's going to happen. Well, you know, I had, I had good feedback from the beginning. So I didn't have people saying, you know, this cookie isn't very good. And, you know, I think about something else that never happened. I had, I had a lot of encouragement from anybody that tried it. They were like, this is delicious and it's healthy. Oh my gosh, it's fantastic. So that definitely propelled me forward. It definitely propelled me forward. And I don't know, I, for, for me, I think I, I love, I love the act of, 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 of making food for people and the magic that happens when they eat it and it works for them. It's like, it's a very intimate connection. Um, and that's been driving me my entire career is that desire to want to solve a problem for people. And that problem is I'm in a hurry. I don't have anything to eat. Oh my gosh, I'm going to have to eat a bag of chips. Ew. Um, and that happens more often than you know, or this super sugary granola bar. Um, and, you know, the thought that, that I can help somebody eat something healthier and they can focus on the task at hand, which is their work or their children or, uh, you know, whatever it is they're doing um, and not be worried about what they're eating is that's what drives me, is, yeah. is, is, is creating solutions for people and helping them finding a product market fit, right? Something that really landed. And, you know, there was a time, it sounds like, where um, you you kind of, the first part of your business hit this wave, which is some of these like trends and some of these fads that were happening in the health and wellness world, right? Uh, between Weight Watchers and uh, Women's World Magazine and the Oprah show, there was a lot of different things that happened for you at that time. Tell me a little bit more about what happened when you hit that wave and then what happened when those when those when those fads or trends <laughs> fell, uh, off. fell yeah. off and you're like okay back to the drawing board i gotta kind of reset tell me about that whole story that process yeah yeah so weight watchers was just kind of a phenomenon you know when i got the, the cookies into the grocery stores um you know i had a weight watcher member call me and she's like you know these are amazing you know can we order more and uh they just you know what I guess with the meetings they would share food items that they liked with each other and it just kind of spread like wildfire and I, you know I think the I think the point for them was they could find something you know the breakfast cookie was filling it was delicious and it it, it fell within the right points of, of that current point system um, that they really liked and you know when something works it spreads like wildfire because I certainly wasn't you know pushing the message with millions of dollars of advertising. I didn't have glossy ads. I didn't have anything, but the fact that the cookie was working for these, for these Weight Watchers members. And so when that took hold, you know, I went from like myself and one other person to like a hundred people hand scooping cookies oh. as fast, as fast as we could within a year. How, how much um, that was with, within one year, you scaled from you and one other person to 100 people yes. and space, I'm assuming, uh, and so yeah. you have to start hunting for yep. space to lease. How do you scale that fast in a year? Yep. Tell me about that. That's crazy. Yeah. Well, actually, I had to move twice because, you know, it started to hit, and I was in the I was in 2,000 square feet. It was my first commercial space. It was below Boundary Bay Brewery. I don't know. If, it's funny because Boundary Bay is using it for their, like their hop storage and, uh, you know, kind of brew storage and. My handprint is still in the floor, so I go in there sometimes and check it out. It's oh. so cool. So that was my first space, and that was 2,000 square feet, you know, and, and um, I'm like, I've got to move. So then we moved to the location on Champion and Railroad. That was 5,000 square feet. We were only there for like six months, and it was pretty clear that I had to move again quickly. So then we moved out to the space on Meridian, which was 15,000 square feet. That was all within a year. Um, and it was just the craziest year ever. Now, I will say, you know, there's a term in the business. I don't know if it's, in, you know, in your business, but sales, sales solve everything, right? Mm -hmm. So if your sales are good and you've got money coming in, you can scale 
You know, yeah. you can, you can, you know, I mean, it, it's maybe not the most efficient and strategic, but at least you can move and you can move fast if you've got cash coming in. And, um, you know, at the time we were selling a lot of cookies. So that was one of the things great, you know, I'm really grateful for is that we, I, I could afford to do it. And that was something I had never had before. I'd never had capital. I'd never had the opportunity to, you know, make a big move. So to go from 2000 square feet to 15,000 square feet in a year, um, and a hundred employees was, was a huge, was a huge jump, but you know, we just scaled exactly what we were doing. And then, you know, I, I and then and then started the search to look for the right type of machine to actually automate the you know the, the 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 extruding of the dough and the making of the puck to go into the oven. So so you had a good problem, which was you had this huge pent up demand. You have you had a a nice cornered market, which was nutritional uh, wholesome cookies, and you're scaling super fast. So the interesting part to me is that you're talking about like you had good cash flow. You had money coming in for the business because you're selling, I, I read a number of, was it 50,000 cookies a day? Uh, yeah, probably about that. Right. I mean, it was no, so long. No <laughs> idea. You just had grains of cookies going like on a conveyor belt going through your mind, right? Yeah, it's a lot of cookies. It's a lot of cookies. A lot of cookies. And so the interesting part of what you're talking about is that you had good cash flow and step one is that you just you just needed to make the move. You needed to make that move to that space. Good problem because you have good cash flow. And then the next step is like, how can we make these systems work better? What was that transition like from going from two people to a hundred people to saying, okay, we need to automate some some of these processes to to, to make this more uh, feasible? What was that process like for you? Right. Well, at the time, um, I was having a really hard time finding equipment to extrude. The, the dough, the, the breakfast cookie dough, the breakfast cookie dough was very unique. There really, at the time, was not anything like it on the market at all. And it's a very nutrient dense dough. Oats are the first ingredient and prune puree is the third ingredient. And then you've got nuts and dried fruit and seeds and nut butters. And it was a very, it's a very, very heavy, thick dough. Uh, whereas most cookies that were being extruded um, really weren't being extruded, they were being deposited, which means they were just kind of being, you know, a dough depositor, it, they drop, you know, and it's more of a kind of a batter type consistency. So it just moves through really with, with ease and not a lot of resistance because you're just talking about white flour and white sugar and right. flavoring basically. And maybe, maybe some nuts, maybe some chocolate chips, but if I mean, lucky, right? we, all, we all, we all know what commercially, co what commercial cookies taste like. Think of a Chips Ahoy, you know, yeah. that's what kind of equipment was out there. And so I had to uh, find equipment that wasn't necessarily for cookie dough. It was for uh, meat. It was like a meat extruder um, and have these machines retrofitted uh, because they were, had you know, higher horsepower and they could push my dough. So it took, it took a bit to, to figure all of that out. Um, but we did it pretty fast because, you know, the, the sun was shining, right? I mean, I, 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 I never assumed that, that, that you know when a wave hits you know you never want to assume that it's going to last and right. you need to plan for you need to plan for the wave to to terminate and so i knew i had to move fast so it, it took a little bit maybe six months to to get that automated and then we were able to kind of scale back on the amount of bodies we had in there and and have a good amount of, of, of people and machines so so would you say that it's important as an entrepreneur in any industry, you're going to have these surges. You're going to have these times that you're leveling up. There's surges. There's certain fads or trends or or markets or whatever it may be. A new new market emerges. You're saying you ride that wave. You put your head down and you just grind it out. But you're preparing at the same time for the other side of the wave when the wave crashes, right? I think that's prudent. Yes. Is there is there opportunity on the other side of the wave if you prepare correctly? I yeah. I think there's always opportunity, and it's. Absolutely. It's so easy to get used to the good times, you know, the high times, the, um, you know, cash is rolling in times. Um, but inevitably for, you know, my business is a quarter of a century old. Um, and I have experienced everything from, you know, good times to really, really tough times and um, a number of different times, not just once. Um, so the longer your business is around, the more you're going to experience that. And you have to plan for, you, you, you plan for the worst and expect for the best. Yeah. You know, 
tell, tell me a little bit more because I, as an entrepreneur, I pride myself in my failures and learning from other people's fail, failures. I think that they're the, the best teachers that we could possibly have. Tell me, and for those of, of you that are out there watching, I would love to hear a little bit more about what are some of your biggest failures and lessons as an entrepreneur? And tell me a little bit about those situations. How did you pivot in that situation? Did you just immediately jump on a solution? Did you sit there and process? How, how do you operate as an entrepreneur in challenges or failures? That's a good question, Leo, because, you know, we, what we t t talk about in, in the building here in the bakery is, you know, is fail fast. And what that means is, is we're not afraid to try stuff, uh, but we know that failure is not necessarily, it's trying, and if we don't hit the mark, we, we try again. Um, and I guess, you know, biggest failures, I don't, as I'm sitting here, I can't really pinpoint any big failures in my career. You know, I've always, desire to work collaboratively. That's really what, what comes most naturally to me. I, I, I love to work in a group and I love to surround myself with, with wonderful people and people that are smarter than me. And, and then I can bring my own, I can bring my own brilliance, but you know, others are just as important. And, you know, we've really made great decisions together, um, moving, moving through, um, you know, the history of the company. Um, and I, I don't know. I mean, I wish I wish I could. I wish I had some big juicy failure story, but I just don't. I I don't consider anything that we've done here a, a failure. More of a lesson than anything, right? Yeah, I mean that's how we learn. Um, you know, it's funny. I was I I, I you know I watched Anne Marie's um, interview. Uh, you know, she's one of my dearest friends, and you know she talked about how she got her MBA. You know, to learn how to run her business and um, and. I, this is my MBA. I'm, you know, my MBA is happening in my business. I didn't go to college. I just, I just got to work. Um, and so the failures are nothing but learning opportunities. And, um, you know, I, I would have to say that I pride myself with being conservative, um, not taking huge risks and relying on my team to help me make the best decisions possible for everybody in the building. So the failures are, are learnings. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely can, couldn't agree with you more. One of the things you just talked about is something that really, really resonates with me, which is this concept of this word entrepreneur is like such a glorified term. I like to call it entrepreneur, right? Because everyone's just like trying to be this like cool startup. Yeah. Oh, I have my hand in 10 different fires, right? Whatever, or irons in 10 different fires. But you just, you just mentioned something that, that really resonates with me. And some of the people that I've interviewed on here have said the same thing, which is an entrepreneur is surrounding themselves with the, their weakness points, right? Their weak points. And tell me about your team and how they've helped you navigate as an entrepreneur through pretty much everything with their skill sets they add to your, to your world. Uh, well, my longest time employee, her name is Dawn Ernest, and she's been with the company on October 23rd, will be her 20th anniversary. Wow. Yep. And Dawn started with us uh, in our customer service department, and now she's our vice president of operations. And, you know, besides me, she has the most tribal knowledge in the building. And she has been, you know, a faithful friend and confidant and, um, you know, a wonderful advisor. And she, she has the things that I don't, you know, she is incredibly organized, <laughs> you know, incredibly organized, um, really great at being um, an amazing supporting um, role for me. Um, you know, she knows me so well, so it's like she can finish my sentences and read my thoughts. Um, Blade Lawson is our director of production. He's been with us for almost seven years and he's he's a, he's a young and very talented uh, young man and um, came to us um, from another food manufacturing facility and so had a lot of um, experience already to apply um, and he's just he's he's just really me just mechanically so smart and I love the way his mind is and he um, does a great job with our production crew and um, you know we have a great QA director um, David Keeler um, again really you know I, I head up R&D but I kind of lack that scientific background um, that 
R&D needs. So David and I do a lot of collaboration there. He has a very, you know, he has an in-depth scientific background of, you know, food science. And um, so that's incredibly helpful. And, um, and then Rob McCormick, who is um, actually my business partner um, now. Um, and Rob grew up here in Bellingham and um, he's about 10 years, eight years younger than me. And it's funny because when I first started making breakfast cookies, he uh, was in high school still. <laughs> wow. So weird. Um, and he was, he'd stop at Cruise and Coffee on his way up to the mountain and get a coffee and a breakfast cookie. And he loved the breakfast cookies in high school. And then Rob went to college. He went to Wazoo. Then he went out into the world. His first job was with Jones Soda. So he got this really cool job with this, you know, great hip, you know, forward thinking uh, company. And then he um, later after that went to work for five hour energy and we're all familiar with those little energy shots. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Also another really innovative and interesting company. Uh, and he was director of global sales. So he got a lot of experience, um, you know, in the global sales market. Rob and I connected about six years ago and he said, Hey, my wife and I want to move back to Bellingham. I'm from Bellingham. I love your cookies. And we talked for about a year before we decided to work together. And, um, you know, we, we just have a great relationship and, and complement each other very much in terms of his strengths and my strengths. And, you know, it's, it's a true business partnership um, is something that you can't, it, you can't buy it. You just lucky enough to find it. Yeah. Uh, and, and I have, I have that and it's, it, it's really the best thing about my work is the people that I work with and I love to come to work every day. So we've got a great team and they're all really smart at things that I'm not. Mm -hmm. So I mean, your blind spots for sure. Uh, indeed. Indeed. So one of the cool things is that, you know, you hear different business models and obviously I've got my opinion, so I'm not going to like dive too much into my opinion, but I am very curious. We talk about culture and culture is kind of this buzzword in corporate world or business world. Right. But mm -hmm. I like the word environment better. Um, mm -hmm. how, how have you created this, uh, this ecosystem, this environment where people want to stay? I mean, that's one of the biggest things is obviously if someone wants to go, you, it sounds like you're supportive of people doing their thing, but you've created this world. You've continued to grow your world to accommodate the best of the best in your world here locally, at least. Right. And so how, how do you do that? What, what is, what is your secret sauce, your secret recipe uh -huh, to, uh, uh, to, to culture and environment? What do you, what's important to you about your culture and environment? Well, you know, we, we have a few um, words here that we use on a regular basis. And, um, you know, one is compassion. And the other is, you know, the other two are, you know, consistent communication. And, um, you know, when I set out to kind of reset the culture after my previous business partner left um, and left the business um, about six years ago, I really wanted to create a culture that was, you know, really more representative of me and how I wanted things to be here. Um, and it took, it took a little while to, um, to really get that culture set because you, most, most workplaces are, you know, it's kind of a simple formula of like, you know, he, you know, here's your task list, do, do what I'm telling you to do and do it right. And that's it. And it's not very often where you, and I mean, it's becoming more so, but, but, you know, six years ago, seven years ago, I found that, you know, a lot of employees would come in and they'd say like, wow, I've never had my boss ask me what I think, or if I have any ideas or, um, you know, how's your family or, um, how are you or stop to talk to me or spend time with me in the middle of the day or, um, you know, pay attention to me, show me, show me attention. And so we really started acting in those ways, you know, treating people the way we wanted to be treated. And that was our filter. Um, but it's easier than, than you might, it's not as easy as you might think. Um, also, I, well, for those that were in administrative roles and leadership roles, where there was a lot more dialogue about it and it was a lot more demonstrable, 
it was a little more difficult to uh, to infuse into our production uh, staff. Um, you know, bigger staff, a little bit more complicated in terms of, of management. And, um, you know, it was a little more difficult for people to grasp what it really meant. You know, what does compassion mean? You know, compassion doesn't mean that, you know, you can come in late all the time. <laughs> was lying. Yeah, um, you still have to be responsible. You still have to be accountable. But, um, you know, compassion means that, hey, I want to hear about why you were late and if we can make adjustments so that you can get to work on time. That's what compassion means. Compassion means I'm not going to fire you. Compassion means I want to hear about what's going on with you so that you can't make it to work on time. And so it took, it took some time to really kind of get that, um, get that message really infused into the staff. And, um, you know, those types, you know, this type of culture can be a, a little messy at first because people just don't, it, it's, they're not familiar with it. They're not familiar with it and people want it. But what they don't realize is they actually have to contribute to it also. Right. So they have, they have to think about their coworkers, you know? I mean, if we're down five people on the production floor, that means the production staff is here two hours longer. That's, that's so, a lot. Yeah, yeah. So, so you know, what, what we worked really hard with, with our staff is like, hey, come outside of your own bubble and, and, and treat people how you'd like to be treated. And, you know, how would you feel if, you know, your buddy called in sick because he just didn't want to go to work that day, but it made you have to work two hours longer. Oh, right. You know, so it, it's just this kind of retraining of how we think about ourselves and how we think about others and thinking um, of one another as, um, a, as a unit, you know, we're a team. And how do, you, how do you gain that cohesiveness within the team and you help people understand that there are, are ramifications to acting in a way that when you're in a bubble, yeah. you know? So as you, I mean, okay, so there's two worlds really there and there's kind of a blend in between. There's this small, small business. So there's you and the one other, one other person that was working with you. And at that point, it's probably pretty easy. To, like if you don't show up, this half of things don't happen. Or if I don't show up, this half of things don't happen. But as you spread that, um, that that those tasks and all the all the things that need to get done to get ha have the business move forward, you have more and more people that may not maybe a little bit further out from the core of why things are happening. How do you continually remind people, or how to how do you find the right people that have that kind of the bug in their ear that like I'm doing this for something bigger than myself, and how do you give them autonomy to feel like they have a role and are not just kind of, you know, part of the assembly line, right? Yeah. Well, we do a lot here in the building. Uh, we have regular um, all company meetings uh, where we update everybody on everything from, you know, what's new in operations, what's happening in operations. Um, you know, we're looking at, um, you know, key performance indicators on a regular basis and sharing those, you know, sharing that information with our, with our team about how they're doing. Um, you know, with their efficiencies, um, celebrating wins and, you know, failing fast and, and, and trying again with losses. And, um, you know, we have an open door policy here, you know, nobody, nobody sits behind closed doors. Um, both myself and Rob are available to anybody in the building at any time. I mean, I have, I give my phone number to anybody that wants it here in the building. Um, and, you know, we interact with staff all day long and, I think it's really about making it safe so that people can feel safe to, 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 you know, to come to us and talk to, talk to us about what's going on for them or what's, what, where they're being challenged, um, talk about ideas and, you know, everybody just wants to be heard and they want to, they want to feel like what they're saying has value. Um, and it does, it does. There's brilliance in everybody and the more comfortable and safe people feel, um, the more brilliance that comes out and that benefits everybody inside of the building. Okay. So, you know, it's, it, and again, it's, it's something that, um, you know, first it's aspirational and then you have to, um, you know, create the, the system to execute that aspiration. And then you have to practice it every day. 
uh, and support it every day and spend the money and the time um, to really get it um, to get it solidified within the building and within you know all the hearts and minds of everybody here. Couldn't have said it better. Yeah, and and for somebody like you too, this is takes my mind in this direction. For somebody like you that is so giving and supportive of the people in your world, you're not only are you trying to bring a or have you brought a product to the market that is making people's lives better uh, nutritionally, physically, um, ener energetically, whatever you want to say. Um, but, but also, um, you, you only have so many hours in a day. So when you're first doing this, you're like the grunt work, the trench work, the CEO work, the CFO work, all, every single possible thing, you're doing all of that. And then you get to a point where you're doing this part and then there's other people that are doing other parts. You have leverage in your business and can empower other people. How do you, how do you say no? Like what, how important is saying no, even when you're a giving person, how do you find that balance of being like, I have to prioritize this other thing versus this thing? How do you say no to people? Well, there's a quote that I keep in the front of my mind at all times. I can't remember which book I read it in. I wish I could, but it was a couple years ago. And it said, the main thing is, is to remember to keep the main thing the main thing. <laughs> Love it. <laughs> and um, if you don't, if you don't um, focus on your big initiatives, you know, you're, 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 you tackle your big irons. If, if you're not putting enough energy and effort towards big initiatives, you're not moving the needle. And so I really, it's so easy to get distracted, especially as a CEO or a founder where, you know, you have that autonomy to say, hey, I really want to start this project or, hey, I, I really like this idea or, hey, I want to, you know, paint the break room or, or whatever, you know. Um, I run it through the filter of, you know, is, it, is, it, is this contributing to the main thing? Is this contributing to what's most important right now? Um, and that's, that's really how I keep things prioritized. And it's, it's hard because I am a, you know, squirrel squirrel, you know, I mean, I, I see something shiny and I, you know, I go after it and, um, or, um, you know, the other thing too is people, if someone is hurting, if they're upset, I mean, I look at people's eyes and people's faces every day around here. Right. And, and you know, when, when, when I see somebody that's not happy or something's going on for them, or if they need to talk to me, or if they have something really special to share, you know, something really positive. Um, you know, I, I always make time for people always. So, and I found that, you know, I mean, I'm not going to end up in a room for three hours with somebody. I mean, it's, it, you know, any of those conversations never take more than an hour, you know, at the latest. So at the longest. So it, it, I think where I, where I, where I don't apply that prioritization is with, is with people because people are our most valuable resource. And um, it's where the magic happens. I know I keep going back to that, but the magic doesn't happen on the to-do list. The magic happens with the people. Um, so with all the different things that I could get my fingers into, all the different things that I could research, all the different things that I could read, all the different people I can network with, it all goes through the filter of, what's most important right now and am I doing and what is, is what I'm doing contributing to that? So it's not just about other people. Are they contributing to, to the big vision? It's about you as one person, as a part of that team, are you also, even though you have a little bit more autonomy or hypothetically would have a little bit more autonomy as the founder or the um, R and D uh, person for the company, but you're also saying you're looking at yourself as you would look at anybody else within your company and saying, well, this doesn't align with our, our values or this doesn't align with our priorities right now. So that's, it's really important to look at yourself as a, like, you're not, you're not on a different, different uh, echelon by being the business owner. You have to look at it from a like full world perspective, right? Uh, for me, my filter is, you know, remember to keep the main thing, the main thing and um, you know, what's most important right now, but I can say my staff is, is right behind me on that. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's no margin in this business. There's no, there's really, really not a lot of margin for error. And there's not a lot of margin for wasting time, even, 
burning time and wasting time even on a daily basis. So everybody here, I think, is really uh, definitely in support of that. So I can say we're, we're, all, we're all applying that to our work every day. That, that's so awesome to hear. And uh, let's little talk a little bit about competition. So knowing that your business is unique, right? As an entrepreneur, finding market product market fit, um, you have to be passionate about it. You have to be someone that actually really cares about what you're doing. So you have those two things. But then you're not the only person out there that's creating some sort of health food, right? So there's, tell me a little bit about competition. I know there was something that happened with Kellogg early on in the, in the business. Tell me about competition. Tell me about what, how you look at competition as an entrepreneur and what happened with that. Well, um, competition is just that. I mean, the competition is a healthy thing. I mean, if there wasn't, you know, it, it certainly is, um, you know, it keeps the fire going underneath us and um, it inspires us. We see products that, that, that inspire us and, and um, you know, we, we create our own version of, of, of what inspires us. Um, so competition's really good in that way because it's just like this ongoing um, s s resource of new and innovative ideas. So um, it's certainly a positive thing for sure. Um, you know, it's funny, it's ironically, I actually have this because I was looking at it. So I don't, you can probably see this. This is a Quaker breakfast cookie. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that happened, um, I think in 2005, maybe 2004, after they came to my booth at the Fancy Food Show and they were like, oh, hey, breakfast cookie, this is a good idea. And then they launched their, their product a couple of years later. And a couple years Prior to that, um, speaking about Kellogg's, we, um, you know, I came up with the first breakfast cookie in commerce. I mean, you know, someone's grandma may have been making a breakfast cookie at home, but she wasn't selling it in grocery stores across the nation. Yeah. So I decided to try to protect that mark of breakfast cookie. And I was advised by my attorney not to because it was a very generic descriptive term, meaning there was nothing unique about it like she always told me like you need to like apple computers is a great is a great example because apples have nothing to do with computers so it's a protectable mark um and so i went for it and decided to spend the money and try to gain try to gain the mark and i was within 30 days of of um gaining that mark and uh kellogg's um opposed the mark in the interest of um, just just maintaining its generic form um, and, you know, these huge companies have whole legal departments that, that, that troll um, these applications. They're looking for great ideas. They're looking for ideas that, that they can poach and use. And, um, you know, if they allow something like that to become a registration, then they can't use it. And that was, that's the whole point of, of, of why they do it. And um, I had to walk away from the fight because, you know, their pockets were about, you know, a million miles deeper than mine. Um, and so, you know, that was really disappointing because it was just the beginning. It was just the beginning of my education of being, um, being a David in the world of Goliaths. And, um, you know, the food business is, um, it's really old school and it's really kind of rigged. And um, it's certainly not, not rigged for a small company and a woman owned business to thrive. I can say that. So it's, it's, it's truly been a battle and a labor of love for 27 years and continues to be. Talk to me about your mindset because I mean, you're, both of those things are amazing. Being a woman and owning a business are two imaginative, huge, unique opportunities, just like being a man and, and owning a company. There's all sorts of different opportunities with that, right? And tell me a little bit more about you're stepping into this world and you're already getting pushback from a old school industry where it's like, well, this is the good old boys club. Tell me about what is it like to uh, be in a world, uh, be super focused on your vision and then have these like things that are a positive thing for pretty much everybody, except maybe these, the good old boys club. And then you have this, this situation where these things become that make it, they make it difficult for you because you're, you know, a smaller business and you're a woman, which is, which is 
that's how you're born. You're born a woman. That's how you can't change that. Yeah. You know? you know, I think it, I think it echoes or mirrors the truth about life. Mm -hmm. it, it's just how it is. It's just, it's just how it is. Life is not fair. Sometimes you get a leg up. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you get knocked down. Sometimes you get a hand up. It, it's just how it is. And, you know, the only, if, if we get too far down into that, like all this stuff has happened to me and I've been held down and I've been held back, it, it takes the attention away from what's most important. And what's most important is moving forward. Yeah. And um, I can say that my focus is more about the fact that I have been here for 27 years. And the statistic of I don't even know what the statistic is, but I know it's pretty impressive. Like something like 3% of all small businesses survive 10 years. And even it's an even small, I don't know. It's, 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 it's under 10%. I don't know. It's somewhere in there. Um, survive 20 years. Yeah. And so, you know, I just keep bringing myself back to that. Like, you know what? No, no, I'm, I, I'm better than all of that. It doesn't define me. And I'm proving that by being here for 27 years. With, with no with no investors, no help, no formal education, just myself and the people around me, and a great product. Incredible! It's it's incredible, and it's and, and it's it's about reminding yourself and um, having these checkpoints along the way of hey, I'm still here. Wait, I'm still pinching yourself. I'm still here. Um, you just mentioned something about investment, and a lot of businesses to get started whether they're tech businesses or they're, um, you know, or, or another cookie business or, or a health food company or a local business, whatever it is, a lot of people take on money or take on small business loans and you haven't taken on any money from anybody. Right. That's got to feel, well, how do you do it, that? It does. Well, you know, okay, let's go to the blue bike. Cause you mentioned blue bike. Yeah. So I needed, so let's see, this was 1997. This was three years after I started, four years after I started, 1998. I, I was down in my space below Boundary Bay Brewery. I was using this, I mean, really piece of crap pizza oven. <laughs> it, was, it was bad, wouldn't hold temperature. You know, I could only get four sheet pans in it. I, it was a struggle, you know, I mean, if your oven is small, I mean, you can like mix and, and tray four times as fast as you can bake. So if your oven is, is a pinch point, it's a big problem. So, you know, that's when I was putting in like 16 hours a day and I'm like, I have got to get a different oven. This is ridiculous. So at the time, um, remember going back to when I was living in San Francisco, I was waiting tables, um, but it was like fine dining. So I was making good money and I bought a new car while I was down there. It was my first big purchase. I couldn't believe I even qualified for the loan. I bought myself a red Jeep Wrangler. It was amazing. So in the time between that and the time that I moved here, I had, I had paid off. I had paid it off and I had the title. And so I wrote a business plan. I worked with Tom Dorr up at the Small Business Development Center, wrote a business plan. I had three years of business under my belt. I had success to show. Um, I had this collateral and I went to, um, at the time it was Bank of Bellingham. Uh, for a $10,000 loan and they turned me down. Um, and so I sold my Jeep and I delivered my cookies on that dang bike for like, for like six months on that blue bike. I had an old Schwinn blue bike. Did you at least have a couple gears that have, was it a unicycle or did it have two, two wheels? What were you, what were you doing? It had two wheels. Yeah. No, it was just an old Schwinn bike, you know, it was my tool around town. And I put some, I put some big baskets on the back and I had a big backpack and I would just go up and down, up, you know, all those little places. And then, and then I found some, you know, some old delivery van with a hole in the floor in Anacortes and bought that. And um, I couldn't let anybody drive that because it was too dangerous. So I was the only one that could drive it. And um and so I forget what got, I forget what got us to this. Oh, we, we were just talking about uh, when you are um, going back to the, uh, 
doubling down and just doing the work. And you, you, were, you were talking about the, the oven and how the oven wasn't working and then the Schwinn. Oh, thank you. Thank you. So anyway, so I sold, I sold, I sold the Jeep Wrangler. I got the money from the Jeep. I bought the ovens and, um, you know, I just, I just did what, I just did what it, what it took. And, and that was, that was the only investment money I'd ever asked for. Um, and, um, I was turned down. And, um, so I just, I just figured out how to get through that roadblock and I sold the only asset that I had and just kept moving forward. So, um, you know, it, it's been an incredible journey though, not, you know, just growing slowly but surely and living here in Bellingham and employing people and enjoying this incredible area and um, doing what I love, you know, without having to go into deep debt, you know, to keep a, a dream alive. You were talking about cash flow earlier. And I mean, we went through, we've, we've, we're still going through this crazy time with, with COVID and I don't want to wow. really make this about COVID that much, but there, there, there are these things that happen economically, um, you know, things that happen like COVID that, that might be health wise, but are now economic and political and all these things. But how important is profit and cash flow and having no debt? And the, because debt obviously affects those things, right? Paying back debt or eating into your profit margins. Um, you had no debt. And so going into this, and, and maybe you had reserves and you had all the, this, this, this foundation set, how did you weather this storm going through COVID? Tell me more about that experience. Well, you know, the last six years have been really interesting um, for the company. Um, you know, there were a lot, of, a lot of big hurdles for us in the last six years, uh, starting with the minimum wage increase. Um, you know, we rely, I mean, relied pretty heavily on, um, on not at minimum wage, but a little higher than minimum wage um, for, you know, the bulk of our production staff. Um, and, uh, you know, so weathering and shouldering a 40% increase over four years was, um, what was a big, big thing for us. You know, we're a nationally sold uh, food product and, um, you know, we weren't able to pass on those costs like local businesses were. I mean, you know, the taxpayers of Washington State voted that law in, and I understand, I understand the reason for it and I support it. Um, you know, Washington State businesses were able to pass those, some of those costs, if not all of those costs, on to the consumer that actually voted in the law. We weren't able to. So we have, you know, our breakfast cookie still needs to be a dollar seventy-nine across the country. So um, it's been, it was a really interesting um, and a big, big challenge for us to figure out how to make that work and to continue to be competitive on the shelves on a national level. So. That was a big project um, over a period of four years. Um, you know, the other big project for us was the Food Modernization Safety Act, which was uh, put through by the Obama um, administration and basically making our food supply safer by requiring manufacturing facilities to actually prove that they're doing the food safety, you know, that, 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 they're, that they're doing what they're saying they're doing, um, which is, um, which is which was a pretty dramatic increase in uh, what we had to do and the um, equipment that we had to do it with. So there were some really big costs associated with those two big projects. Um, and um, the other big project that we had was um, an ERP system, which is basically the system that runs the whole bakery. You know, that was another part of um, traceability and, um, you know, just functioning, um, bringing our systems forward so that we could function in a really efficient manner and, and to scale to grow. So those were three giant projects that we had to move through in the last five years that, um, uh, you know, just a lot of work inside the building, a lot of focus inside the building. Um, so really, we weren't able to, you know, do huge innovation and do a lot of stuff outside of the building. Um, so going into COVID, um, you know, we weren't really in a, in, a, in a position where we had, you know, had great, you know, huge new launches and success and, you know, cash rolling in. And, you know, we were just coming off of getting ready for, for growth. Um, and um, COVID has definitely been, um, been very challenging for us, just like it has been for everybody else. Um, 
but again, it shows the strength of our team. And we've been manufacturing from day one. We never shut down. Well, we didn't, you know, we were an essential business. We were, so we continue to manufacture and uh, everybody in the building remained um, healthy and um, united and very grateful to be here and very grateful to be continuing to, um, you know, do what we do. Uh, we certainly saw a lot of disruption in supply chain and um, in the distribution chain um, from getting our product, you know, here from the bakery to the shelf. Um, there was a lot of disruption uh, in, in that distribution chain. So uh, causing, us, causing us a disruption in sales. So, you know, again, I say that with a grain of salt because I know that every other business out there um, with the exception of construction, um, <laughs> construction and recreation. I don't know. There's lots of businesses that are doing great right now, but then there are some that, that aren't. Um, so um, we experienced our fair share of challenges, but you know, again, um, we, the, the, the only choice is, is to move forward and to adapt and to evolve. And that's what we're doing. And we have a, we have a wonderful staff here that is committed to that as well. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Um, really, really curious about before we, before COVID hit, you and I had met at Anne Marie's house and we were, we, we were talking about getting together for this, this, this podcast, this episode here Yeah. back in probably February, March, January, and January. Oh my gosh. It's this year's flown by. And I know. you were saying this is before COVID and you were saying, I've got this product that I'm working on and I, yeah. I, time to get this out and then I'm happy to go on the podcast and I was like Aaron the podcast is not more important than your than your new product how I'm, I'm offended but really you you created this new product it's in Costco now tell tell everybody that's watching this and tell me about let me what grab is, the package I'll be right back cool Here I am so it's called the better cookie this is the almond butter flavor. So this product, um, near and dear to my heart, I created this product because, I don't know, you know, you get to your middle age, um, and I would say middle age is not a bad term because if I'm in middle age, that means I'm going to be 102. And <laughs> I'd really like to make it that far. So, but, you know, I'm eating less gluten, less sugar, uh, you know, less refined products basically and so this product the better cookie is grain-free gluten-free paleo and vegan All the things. so um, what that means is no refined sugar no grains and um, and uh, you know we're utilizing um, ingredients like cassava flour which is a root um, and we're using almond flour coconut uh, oil almond butter coconut um, nut butters, things like that, really dense nutrition. So uh, we launched our first, uh, we had our first launch at Costco in the Pacific Northwest on March 18th. Perfect bad time. timing. You timed that really. really bad. <laughs> no sampling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you know, sampling is really important at Costco, especially for a product that's healthy, right? Because people want to try it. Um, but you know, it, it, it went pretty good. It went pretty good. So we were pretty happy with the results considering everything that was going on, you know, the, the, the lack of traffic going through Costco, uh, no sampling. So it, it went really well. And um, we've also launched at um, Sprouts, which is um, it's about a 350 store chain, um, not in Washington, but the Southwest California. And then um, the Better Cookie also launched in uh, LA, in the LA region of Costco. Costco uh, last month and did rock and good. So um, LA is a good LA is a good place to to launch a product like this. So we're looking forward to a lot more business um, with Costco with this product. Um, we love to do business with Costco. They're a great partner for us, um, and we'll be launching this um, you know nationally with other retailers as their buying offices open back up, which has been also such a bummer because, you know, we worked hard on this product um, for, you know, to get this ready for market. And all of a sudden, you know, beginning of the year when all these reviews were happening, category reviews, which only happen once a year. So if you miss it, you've got to wait, you know, an entire calendar year to represent. 
um, buying offices were closed and buyers were not looking at new products. Grocery stores were not even going to think about bringing in new products. So it's interesting when you think you've, you know, you've got an ace in the hole, right? You know, it, it's all the buzzwords. I mean, it's not only is it vegan, it's paleo. Not only is it paleo, but it's grain free and gluten and gluten free. So we knew we had a great product and we knew we had something that could be kind of a unicorn, you know, in a way, you know, that if there's enough dietary designations, it's, it's, it's going to do well, it, especially if it tastes good. Mm-hmm. Um, and it just came to a, to a screeching halt. So, um, you know, it's, it, and I would never would have seen this coming ever. So, um, but it's, we have two flavors. We have the uh, chocolate, salted uh, chocolate cashew, and we have almond butter as a second flavor. Really and, good. Yeah, they're, they're, I, I would have to say they're quite delicious. So you'll be seeing them, Bellingham audience, you'll be seeing them out and about. Um, hopefully Hagen will be bringing them in. Hagen and Co-op will hopefully, hopefully be bringing them in soon. So Costco, obviously you can buy them on your online store. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. All all of those links and details will be in the comments below and every press release we do will have all the links to be able to find everything that is Aaron Baker's wholesome baked goods. Um, So I'm really excited. And I'm really excited because I haven't actually had a chance to try them and I actually have not been eating gluten for five, five years. I get really sick. So um, those sound delicious. So I'll have to pick up a case of those from you um, or box or wherever they come in. What's that? You can stop by the bakery and see me. So, sounds awesome. So, uh, Aaron, what is next for for your company? What are what are you looking forward to in the future for your for your company for Bellingham? What's what are you looking forward towards? I, you know, my my big hairy audacious goal. You know, those of us that are in the entrepreneurial world world know that 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 term BHAG, uh, my big hairy audacious goal is always um, is for Baker to be the next Quaker. And, um, you know, that's, that's where I'd love to take this company uh, to be a household name, a trusted household name in every in every kitchen in America. Um, For parents to say I buy this product because I know Erin Baker, I know that she makes great food and know and I know that she wouldn't make something that she wouldn't eat herself. And I think that the food world on a large scale lacks that greatly. Um, you know, large food companies are um, controlled by shareholders and by shareholders and profitable needs and um, poor decisions are made. You know, you spoke earlier about, you know, what's wrong with our food system. Um, our food was industrialized and it was designed, um, you know, after the war, after, you know, in the 50s was industrialized and it was designed to sit on the shelf for 12 months. Oh, that's a great idea because we can make more money. We can make everything in centralized locations. We can ship it on rail cars. You know, we don't have to get it there fast before it spoils. You know, that's when artificial flavorings came in. That's when artificial colorings came in. That's when, um, you know, farming became really, you know, not good. And, um, you know, the, much of the food that's out there in packages, it's, 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 there's nothing alive about it. There's nothing nourishing about it. Um, and this is, it's a great, it's, it's a, it's a great big problem that we have in this country is that we're, we're, we're largely eating food out of packages. And most of that food is really, really not good for us. Um, and so Rob and I really want to bring an honest and truthful and healthy food to the American family. And that's, that's what's next. How long it'll take us to get there. I don't know, but we're making a dent in it. Um, You know, another thing that we do and something that is so important and so core to who we are is we feed kids at the boys and girls clubs. And about 10 years ago, um, I, um, decided to be a parent in a different way other than just the traditional way of having my own children. And I went to the boys and girls clubs and I saw what was happening there. And they were, you know, all these little kids were flocking around these vending machines and vending machines that were there um, because, you know, the people that own the vending machines built the gym. Mm -hmm. So um, therefore they could have their vending machines there. And what's in the vending machines? Candy and soda. 
and these little kids are spending what little money they had on candy and soda. And um, I said to the director, I said, you know, I'd really like to help here. You know, can I, can I bring you breakfast cookies? And that was 11 years ago. And to date we have donated um, almost 800,000 cookies uh, to 18 oh. clubs yeah, in Washington state. And um, basically it's, it's, it's the one snack that kids have access to 24 seven at the boys and girls clubs. 60% of the kids at the clubs are food insecure. And what that means is that they do not know where their next meal or snack is coming from. They could very well go home and have bare shelves and no parent at home to feed them. So they're going home with breakfast cookies in their backpacks. They're going home on the weekends with breakfast cookies in their backpacks. They're going to school in the morning with breakfast cookies in their backpacks. They're eating breakfast cookies while they're at the club. I mean, the food programs have definitely improved at the clubs since we started this program. Uh, Heather Powell and, and her incredible team um, that, that take care of the kids in Whatcom County do a wonderful job with the food now. Um, and it's really changing, but the breakfast cookie is a staple healthy snack for the kids and it has been for 11 years. And it's simply a percentage of our sales and our give is consistent with other large companies like General Mills to children's programs. Um, so the more, the more product we sell, the more, the more cookies we donate and we just simply ship them to the clubs every month. It's amazing. So, you know, that's, that's the other big thing. And that's, that's our effort to reduce childhood obesity, to reduce childhood, you know, food insecurity and to show kids to habituate them to food that actually has food value in it. You know, most kids are habituated to high sugar content, high fat content, foods that are, that, that should only be eaten on a very special occasion and in, 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 you know, in moderation at, at that. And they're not, they're eating it multiple times a day. And this, you know, they think a banana pop tart is what a banana tastes like. No, that's it's not, not. it's not what it, and they don't like a banana, you know, because it doesn't taste like the sugar, you know, rocket that's, that's in their mouth. So the other, you know, big, big point that I was trying to make is let's get these kids taste buds back to what, where they should be and, and where their body is craving whole food and not the candy bar. Right. So it's been an incredible journey with Boys and Girls Clubs. They're an amazing organization. I mean, talk about selfless and incredible leadership. Um, they're raising this country's youth, truly. And it, I, I, we're, honored, we're honored to be, to be working with them to help them raise these kids. It's, it's very inspiring. Um, it, it has to be a part of your business is how can you, not only how, how can you grow it, but how can you impact your community? And so thank you so much for your contribution to our next generation. Um, you know, yeah. it's, it's just amazing. I, I'm, I'm also just, my mind's a little bit blown. I'm trying to imagine, like, it's like a math equation of how many, if you stacked 800,000 cookies in one room, what that would look like. Um, it's a lot of cookies. A lot of cookies. 11,000 a month. It's a lot. It's a lot of cookies, but a lot of nutrition. So thank you so much for that. And uh, Aaron, thank you for joining me from your, from your, as David Attenborough would say, from your, your natural habitat. Natural habitat. That was, no, you said it better. You say it again. Oh, <laughs> thank you for joining us from your natural habitat. He's got a little bit more theatrical uh, British voice, but. Uh, That's awesome. I love it. Aaron, thank you for sharing your story and being vulnerable and uh, taking some time with us today from, from probably innovating and baking some more cookies. And for those of you that are watching this, thank you so much for joining us. And obviously, if you have any questions for Aaron, um, you can contact her. Um, you know in the kitchen, they're baking cookies. Uh, yeah. Contact us if you have any questions. Obviously, um, for those of you that are looking for an amazing solution for breakfast or for snacks, because I know I'm a big snacker. I snack, I eat a lot of food. I snack a lot. So um, for any questions, we'll be putting all of the links to um, Aaron's uh, company to be able to find the products that you want on, on our website um, through that. Um, this is live stream on Facebook. So thank you for joining us today, everyone for our live audience. And then obviously, uh, if you're looking for if you missed part of this, um, go to YouTube, and it will be on Spotify, it will be on Stitcher, it'll be on Apple Podcasts, all of the above. So thank forever. you. What's that? Forever. Forever. It's here forever. Yeah. yeah.
Aaron, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for joining us. And uh, I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. And uh, everyone, thanks for watching. Thanks, you guys. Building Bellingham is a community podcast exploring leadership, challenges, failures, and business with entrepreneurs right here in Bellingham, Washington. You can watch interviews live and be the first to hear about upcoming guests on the Building Bellingham Facebook and Instagram pages. Again, I'm your host, Leo Cohen of the Cohen Group Northwest. This episode was produced and edited by Cooper Hansley and Tiffany Holden. Our logo was designed by Sam Vogt. To learn more about the team behind the podcast, search Cohen Group NW on Google, Facebook, Instagram, or LinkedIn.